Johnny Gould's Jewish State is brought to you with Dangor Education. Today, I pay tribute to Britain's Jewish soldiers who served alongside their allied comrades facing down the German enemy on Normandy's beaches from D-Day starting the 6th of June 1944. Among the many was 93-year-old Stanley Fisher from Solihull. He's the great-grandfather of my cousin Samuel. Did you see action on the way? Uh, we were... not until we got near Arnhem. But we got the, to the bridge. We were trying three battalions over to try and get the paratroops and the troops out. And out the three battalions, I think, number-wise, we lost a lot of men, a lot of men. Over 60,000 Jews served in the British Armed Forces, including 14,000 in the Royal Air Force, 15,000 in the Royal Navy, and another 30,000 Jews from Palestine also served in the British military. Some were members of special operations, parachuting behind enemy lines. About 10,000 of the Jewish refugees from Hitler enlisted in alien pioneer companies and the 5,000-strong Jewish Infantry Brigade Group, commanded by Brigadier E.E. E. Benjamin, fought in Italy, gaining four military crosses, two OBEs, four MBEs and 68 mentions in dispatches. Overall, 3,024 British Jews and 694 Palestinian Jews, a total of 3,718 died in battle during the war and 1500 were awarded medals three given the Victoria Cross three the George Cross my conversation with Stanley was completely unscheduled in fine fettle and good spirits he was more than willing to recount his story when we slept we were told to dig holes and ignore the gunfire he told me Backing up the mightiest invasion by air, 4,000 ships, combat and landing craft carry the war to the enemy by sea. The Coast Guard, the Navy, the Air Forces land hundreds of thousands of British, Canadians and Yanks on Hitler's doorstep within a few days. Isolating Cherbourg with its strategic harbor is the immediate objective. Landings are made under a naval barrage. President Roosevelt said, let our hearts be stout. And later, Germany is the first on the list for destruction. These troops bucking the choppy seas in the channel heeded his words. I was among the first British soldiers to witness the horrors of Bergen-Belsen. He'd never said a word about his wartime experiences until his late 80s. Stanley had nightmares for years after the war, but then he broke his silence for the benefit of future generations. When we heard about Belson, we thought it was like a prisoner of war camp. When I saw, or what I saw, was horrific. I saw walking skeletons, because at that time that I got there, which was the end of April, beginning of May and uh, they were beginning to move the inmates out and I had nightmares for years after that. And not even the battle-hardened reporter, the distinguished Richard Dimbleby was quite prepared for what he saw shortly after liberation of the Bergen-Belsen camp either. I wish with all my heart that everyone fighting in this war, and above all those whose duty it is to direct the war from Britain and America, could have come with me through the barbed wire fence that leads to the inner compound of the camp. Outside, it had been the lucky prisoners, the men and women who had only just arrived at Belson before we captured it. But beyond the barrier was a whirling cloud of dust, the dust of thousands of slowly moving people, laden in itself with the deadly typhus germ. And with the dust was a smell sickly and thick 
the smell of death and decay, of corruption and filth. I passed through the barrier and found myself in the world of a nightmare. Dead bodies, some of them in decay, lay strewn about the road and along the rutted tracks. On each side of the road were brown wooden huts. There were faces at the windows, the bony, emaciated faces of starving women too weak to come outside, propping themselves against the glass to see the daylight before they died. And they were dying every hour and every minute. I saw men wandering dazedly along the road, stagger and fall. Someone else looked down at him, took him by the heels, and dragged him to the side of the road to join the other bodies lying unburied there. No one else took the slightest notice. They didn't even trouble to turn their heads. Behind the huts, and two youths and two girls who'd found a morsel of food were sitting together on the grass in picnic fashion, sharing it. They were not six feet from a pile of decomposing bodies. Inside the huts, it was even worse. I've seen many terrible sights in the last five years, but nothing, nothing approaching the dreadful interior of this hut at Belsen. The dead and the dying lay close together. I picked my way over corpse after corpse in the gloom until I heard one voice that rose above the gentle undulating moaning. I found a girl. She was a living skeleton. Impossible to gauge her age, for she had practically no hair left on her head and her face was only a yellow parchment sheet with two holes in it for eyes. She was stretching out her stick of an arm and gasping something. It was English, English, medicine, medicine. And she was trying to cry, but had not enough strength. And beyond her, down the passage and in the hut, there were the convulsive movements of dying people too weak to raise themselves from the floor. They were crawling with lice, and smeared with filth. They'd had no food for days, for the Germans sent it down into the camp on block, and only those strong enough to come out of the huts could get it. The rest of them lay there in the shadows, growing weaker and weaker. There was no one to take the bodies away when they died, and I had to look hard to see who was alive and who was dead. Aramanche, where Stanley landed in the days after the 6th of June, became one of two assembly points made up of artificial harbours, temporary jetties of prefabricated concrete supports with steel spans and floating piers, and they were all towed across the channel in sections and aligned in straight lines to the beach. To this day, the remnants of the temporary structures lie just a few yards out to sea. It was also where Allied leaders gave thanks to this remarkable generation that guaranteed our post-war freedom. It's almost impossible to grasp the raw courage it must have taken to our veterans here in Normandy today. I want to say the only words we can. Thank you. Here with you are over 60 veterans who landed on D-Day. Our debt to you is everlasting, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We know what we owe to you veterans, our freedom. On behalf of my nation, I just want to say thank you. Stanley's war continued onto the bridge at Arnhem, a battle which went badly for the Allies, with nearly 2,000 killed and 7,000 captured. Here is Stanley Fisher from the 4th Battalion of the Wiltshire Regiment. This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. For those who listen. For those who are willing to listen. I um, was 18 uh, when I was called up and um, I was called up in, to Canterbury uh, where I had my initial training. And all through the training, no problems with my religion at all. I never came across any either during my whole service time. And I was called up on the 17th of December 1942, I think it was, 1942. <laughs> uh, and, um, and eventually I was posted to a battalion called the Wiltshire Regiment, who I'd never heard of before. 
and I was in the 4th Battalion. And um, when D-Day started, I was stationed in a seaside town called Rye in Sussex. And uh, we were preparing to go across and we went across on the sixth day of, um, that was, they landed on the 6th of June and we went on six days later. Now in dispatches, Stanley, you would have heard of some of the impending suffering, stuff coming back to you in Rye. Uh, Not really, because things weren't, the information you, you had, not a lot. I don't think they wanted to scare us in any way whatsoever. But we went across on a flat bottom landing craft, but we were fortunate in a sense that we were the first uh, people to land on the pontoon that they had built. So we actually landed dry. Right. And And do you think that was the experience of the first six days, that actually they prepared you for a better landing than perhaps the unfortunate guys on the 6th and 7th of June? The the engineers worked wonders, they they really did. And they landed in a place called Aramash, which if you were watching the D-Day landings, that's where we um, went into land. And um, we were stationed at... The painter's place. Um, we were in Monet uh, studio, where I wow. was right. actually in Monet's studio. Right. I, I'm stupid because there were a lot of sketches there, and I didn't do a thing about it. <laughs> plundering then, war, anyway, war. <laughs> the plunderings of war. In fact, I was. Uh, we were. I was a sig- I was seeing signals, the infantry signals, and I was giving. Um, instruction on um, on the radios and uh, what we had to a Morse code etc etc and from there uh, we went right through to Arnhem without stopping and how did you get there we were on, tr- on trucks. trucks and um, we did you see to- action on the way uh, we were, not until we got near Arnhem, but we got the, to the bridge, we were trying three battalions, and I can't remember the battalions now, except my, yeah. and um, three battalions to try and get the paratroops and the f- troops out. And out the three battalions, I think, number-wise, we lost a lot of men. A lot of men. But... That's what we had to do. Nijmegen was the place. Right, yeah, yeah. And then you had over the bridge to Nijmegen. Stanley, when, as an older man now, you think about some of your comrades who lost their lives as young men alongside you, yeah. 18, 19, yes. 20, yes. some of them married with children, you know, yeah. the lives they could have lived here, the freedom that they provided through their lives. It what what goes you through your mind now? Um, Not so much now, but when I first came out, I used to have nightmares Um, because I was, I can't say I was fortunate, but we were stationed uh, just as the war was finished, the fighting, I was stationed in a town called Sella, which is a few miles from Bergen-Belsen. And um, my CO... I uh, knew I was Jewish because I was working with him all the time, being a signaller with him. And I asked permission to go and see the um, the camp. Now, we didn't know what was going on. When we heard about Belson, we thought it was like a prisoner of war camp, like we have here, you know, in Hearts and you're all right, but you're a prisoner. When... I saw, or what I saw, was horrific. I saw walking skeletons, because at that time that I got there, which was the end of April, beginning of May, 
and uh, they were beginning to move the inmates out. And I had nightmares for years after that. More pictures of the atrocity camp at Belsen, where conditions deliberately produced by the Germans were so appalling that people were still dying at the rate of 40 a day long after the liberation. These pictures showing German soldiers and a British guard carrying out the dead were taken towards the end of May. As the emaciated bodies are laid in the mass grave, it's quite obvious that they died of starvation and disease. Already too far gone, when the British entered Belsen, they couldn't take food or respond to medical treatment. At the burial service, first a Jewish, then a Church of England chaplain officiated. Medical authorities on the spot estimate that people will still be dying at least a year from now as a direct result of having been inmates of Belsen. As huts became vacant, they were destroyed, for it was necessary to obliterate the filth and the pestilence of this place as it is to remember what the Germans did here. Fire helps to purify the horror of Belsen, but what can ever cleanse the guilt of Germany? Stanley, how long had it become public knowledge that a Jewish tragedy had occurred at Bergen-Belsen and other places? That was quite fresh news, wasn't it, to many? Yes, at, that, at that time. Yeah. I think, uh, personally, that's when it first... No one really knew what was happening till they got to these camps. And believe me, the engineers and uh, who were, went into those camps... How they handled that, I have no idea. I was only on the fringe of it all. And um, I can't believe what had, had gone on there. I've, for years, I'd never mentioned it. You never heard me mention it to the family at all. I couldn't. Mm. I couldn't even watch a film about Hitler and the camps. It's something that, to me, was... Horrific. Yeah. And for years, I couldn't speak about it at all. So what has changed in the last few years that you are now able to talk about it? What's consolidated in your mind that, that, uh, that's made this happen? I think perhaps because people have to know. Um, and I don't know, you can't forget these. You can't let people forget these things. Because it's so easy. I mean, look at the anti-Semitism we're putting up with now. And there are a lot of Jewish boys that died for this country. Yeah. And Tell us about those Jewish boys. I mean, you will have known friends maybe that you grew up with that didn't survive the war. And of course, friends who, thank God, did come home as well. The Jewish blood that was sacrificed mm. in the name of the Queen and this country. That's right. Um, I mean, King. in my battalion, I think I, that I can remember, I was the only Jewish boy there. And I never had one um, word of anti-Semitism while we were there. We were all in the same boat. Yeah. There was nothing, nothing about religious problems whatsoever. You're listening to Johnny Gould's Jewish State. If you like my regular podcasts, please think about making a donation. My podcasts are free, and I want to keep them free, and so donations really help me keep them that way. Head over to my donations page at www.patreon.com slash Johnny Gould. But there was a Jewish brigade fighting. Right. In Did Palestine. It? No. In, uh, on right. the continent. Right. For some reason, the Jews are always scapegoats. They're, because we're a minority, I think, and they've got this thing in their heads that Jews are making all the money, they run all this and they run all that. And I think it's in their, in their lives. I think they're taught this from kids, those bloody Jews. And this is, I think, where, the, uh, where we could stop this if they were taught from the homes by their parents 
would make a lot of difference. Uh, I'll tell you a little story that um, we were pulled out the line and Pesach was coming up and we are, were asked if we'd like some matzahs for our Passover. I said yes. And we got them for Shavuos. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Well, you know, well, Pesach Shani is an example of something. You could have had it a few, a few <laughs> months later. But, uh, uh, you know, I think this should be underscored. My grandparents came over to this country because of what you did in this country before. They came over in 1939 from Vienna for what you gave and how grateful I was as the grandson that not only was there a lot of tolerance around Birmingham where they finally settled, but also that the people who gave their lives and gave themselves so wholly um, shared their freedom with these people. Yeah. And for that, I think we should never forget it. And it must upset you severely to see the anti-Jewish hatred What's that appears to be happening. What's going on at the moment is beyond me, especially, say, in France. I mean, anti-Semitism there has been going on for a long, long time. And we went into France and got it back for them. But that, don't, that doesn't count anymore. We're not, we're not the... Uh, but I should say we're the enemy now with this Brexit business. Why doesn't it count anymore, Stanley? What's wrong with people? That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> I think that's a question that needs answering. But what you can, how are you going to get it? But apparently Europe and the United States are veering off in different directions. As a person who fought on behalf effectively of both, if you like, <laughs> and Britain, how does yeah. that feel to you? Um, to say this is right or that's wrong. I mean, some things are good, some things are not. So, I was born in 1967 of, in living memory of Holocaust survivors. Mm. For me, this is a living history. I feel what you're telling me. And one day, I'll be gone too. And, you know, I, yeah. And, 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 and you're the direct messenger. I'm a semi-direct messenger. What about, what about my children? Well, what can we tell them to guarantee the peace that was so hard to win? won? I don't know. I, uh, I think this, as going back in history, I mean, there's wars. I don't think there's a time when there hasn't been a war somewhere mm -hmm. going on in this world. And I don't think we're ever going to stop it. And this is the most unfortunate thing of all. We do not learn from uh, what's been going on in our, our history. We do not learn at all. Thank you, Stanley. That was very moving.